I'm sure he hasn't been introduced like that too often, have you, Brother Bill? But uh, the husband of Kathy Vasilakis with the Thank second installment of the Thank series you. today. Yeah. <laughs> I had that many positive comments about Kath's message, and the subliminal message was, move over, Billy boy, <laughs> Kathy has arrived. <laughs> Starting the year on uh, the theme of gratitude and thankfulness is so important. And we are, I'm very thankful for uh, those who have gone before us. And uh, over the Christmas break, I took one of my grandkids to the grave of my parents and, uh, and just told a few stories about my mum and dad. It was just beautiful. And she didn't know. She's kind of, and there's photos of them. I said, look at this. Isn't, isn't, isn't my mum pretty when she was married? And, and, uh, and, and we're grateful for our parents. We're grateful for those who have gone before us. And I'm also, when I became a Christian as a 17-year-old, uh, there were heroes in our denominational family, CRC Churches International. And for those who don't know, I head that movement as well as part of my uh, spiritual duties. And um, so as a young guy, I was really impressed by the heroes within our CRC movement. And there were two women in particular, uh, one called Helen Beard and the other Nancy Harkin, who were pastors. And uh, they were amazing women. And uh, both, just in the last few days, went to be with Jesus in their late 80s. In fact, I'm heading to Mildura tomorrow to be involved in Helen Beard's uh, uh, funeral. But Helen, along with her, her husband, Cliff, they came and did Bible college in 1963. And my wife, Kathy, grew up with, with her children. And some of her kids are pastors as well. And Helen pioneered churches right through South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales. She was a, a mighty apostle, a, a present-day apostle with her husband, evangelising, pastoring churches, and, and a magnificent, magnificent person. And um, so we honour Helen. And for those, you don't know her, but we know her. She's a hero within our CRC movement. The other one is Nancy Harkin, <clears throat> a very soft-spoken, gentle lady, and uh, one of our pastors, not a strong preacher like Helen, but she had um, what we call gifts of the Holy Spirit, gifts of healing and working miracles operating through it. Uh, she herself uh, was dying and was at death's door and God raised her up. And out of that experience, uh, she, uh, I, I, I knew Nancy well and heard her speak and share, and she wasn't a riveting speaker. But I tell you, when she prayed for the sick, healings took place, miracles occurred. And, uh, and so uh, Nancy was what we call a miracle worker. All of us can pray for the sick and expect God to heal them, but some people have a propensity to receive those spiritual gifts. And, and God used Nancy amazingly uh, right throughout Australia. In fact, thousands of people heard the gospel through Nancy's quiet ministry and hundreds of people were physically healed. I mean, amazing instantaneous healings as well as healings that took a bit of time. So Nancy uh, um, in her late 80s as well. So I think it's good for us as a church family to... I'm grateful for them because they were role models and pioneered what ministry was all about. Two of the most loving women you can find. In fact, I never heard a critical word, particularly with Helen, and I knew her probably better. I never heard a critical word coming out of her mouth, but a wonderful pastor, counsellor, carer, and so we honour them. And so, girls, uh, we have examples in our denominational family. I mean, the CRC was ordaining women in the 1940s, light years ahead of, of, of uh, other denominations, and we have no restrictions on women being elders, pastors, preachers, apostles, evangelists, and some of them have done just most amazing, most amazing work. But my wife, Kathy, went to Bible college with me, but she's never pursued the ordination route for varying reasons. And, but she's a preacher and sound theologically and in that way. So you, we just can't serve the Lord uh, for those of us that are male pastors without our spouses. But also there's so many, probably a third of our pastors now in the CRC are women. About a third, which is amazing, fantastic. And so uh, we, we honour, and, and I'm very grateful for those two women that were were trailblazers, hey, in this month of gratitude. So just uh, keep their families in your prayers. I'm grateful that God is both good and great. I really am. Kathy shared so well last week on the goodness of God. 
Um, look at this psalm, Psalm 135. We'll probably read this uh, at the end of this week or early next week. Um, because the Old Testament writers were crystal clear about this. God is good and great. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to his name, for that is pleasant. I like that. It's pleasant. And then he says, I know that the Lord is great, that our Lord is greater than all gods. Interesting, because in that era, there were, like today, a multiplicity of religions. And most of those uh, uh, religions had anthropomorphic views of God, which basically is a big word meaning that, that their gods were created out of man's image. So their fantasies, their thinking, their reflections, their limited mindset, they created a whole pile of gods. And, uh, but the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we see in the Old Testament and New Testament, is absolutely unique. And uh, we are created in His image. He is the God creator, saviour, healer, the only true and wise God, as the Apostle Paul would say in one of his writings, uh, whereas all the other gods are just anthropomorphic, made in man's image. And I mean, you go, you go to, uh, you study Hinduism, and, um, and I had the privilege of actually studying uh, all the major religions at university as a sub-major, did religious studies, and, and you got to believe there are, I think, two, I could be wrong here, certainly two to three million gods. So everything's a god. So there's the monkey god, Hanunun, there's the elephant god, there's a... So, so it's almost like they're projecting, trying to find meaning in life, to find some spiritual, spirituality sense of meaning. Not all of Hinduism is evil. There's a lot of good things regarding ethics and philosophy and values and family. But uh, so, like in all religions, they're, they're people trying to find God and they project themselves and their, their, their faulty views on uh, what God is like. But not not the psalmists, not the New Testament writers. So, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good, and I know that the Lord is great. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. But the New Testament writers were also unequivocal about God's perfect nature. So, in Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him. Do you love Him? He's working on your side, who have been called according to His purpose. He doesn't say that all things are good, and not all things that happen to us are good. Some things are just downright awful and evil, and they're not of God. But He works for our good, and so He can turn any situation to produce some good can come out of it because of His love and presence and grace. So, uh, Paul says he's good, but he's also great. Look at Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine. In your wildest imaginations, God is even more powerful than what you can imagine, according to these power that is at work within us. I mean, I'm interested in all these amazing movies that are around now with, with supernatural elements in them. Like we, yesterday, the kids, the grandkids wanted to see Transformers. And I said, how many Transformer movies are there? About, I don't know, about a dozen of them. But isn't it interesting? There's something within our hearts that we want someone who's all-powerful and who's always good, who will combat evil. So the, I'm saying, which ones are the evil Transformers? Which ones are the good Transformers? Oh, that truck's a good one. That, that, that car's a... Can they turn into... You ever seen Transformers, the movie? It's weird, but it's fun. <laughs> the Marvel comics, and, and, and it's this thing of, of um, there's something within humanity that says there must be an all-powerful presence. There must be a force for good, for justice, uh, for, for healing, to provide answers. And I think it's the quest of the human heart reaching out for meaning. And so movies often are a reflection of our deepest desires. But the answer is that our God has all the power in the universe, and He is great. He is powerful, and He can touch your life today, and we pray that throughout this year, 2019, will be a year where God will display His goodness and kindness and grace and mercy and power in, in your life and in the people that you love, your family, your friends, and others. I'm grateful that God meets my deepest needs. I'm grateful that He's both good and great. I'm grateful that He meets my deepest needs. 
I've got to read this whole psalm to you, then I'll dig in a little bit. This is Psalm 103. It's probably the favorite of, of many of you here. King David says, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name, like he's speaking to himself. He's looking at himself in the mirror. David boy, praise God. And he goes, praise the Lord, my soul. He says, come on, get your pers- I've got to get my perspective right. I've got to be grateful because I don't want to forget all his benefits. And King David, in the midst of a horror story, if you look at David, I mean, a magnificent man of God, but gee, was he, did he have some fault lines in his life? Did he make some boo-boos? Did he muck up? He hurt his family big time, his wife or his wives and, and his children and, uh, and the nation, but he knew how to repent really well. He knew how to, to, he knew how to sin pretty well, but he knew how to repent even better. So, uh, but he says, uh, and all the crises that he had, amazing crises, forget not all his benefits, and he lists them, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases and redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Now, come back to these six good things our kind and all-powerful Heavenly Father does for us and wants to do for us today, tomorrow, the next day, throughout 2019. But look at the the rest of this, this psalm. I've got to read it. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. That's for you, Yen. Isn't that great? He does. Anyone that pursues justice and wants to do the right thing, God will work with them. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. Now have a look at this of who he is, not just what he, we're grateful for not just what he does, like the benefits, but for who he is. David's got good perspective. He says, the Lord is compassionate. Just think about it. He's compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Wow. Or repay us according to our iniquities. Whew, isn't that good? But have a look at this. You want to know how great his love is? How high are the heavens? For as high as the heavens are above the earth. How high? Limitless. The universe is massive. We can't even contemplate it. So great is his love for you. As far as the east is from the west. How far is the east from the west? You can't. They can never meet. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. Wow. And look at this, as a father. And again, this is unique. No, no other religion of all the religions of, of, in our world have a concept that God is a perfect father. You can't compare them. I mean, if you, if you read the Quran, and the Quran has some great things in it, some great surats in it. And uh, so Islam has, they've taken a lot of stuff from the Old Testament. They've taken some bits of the New Testament. And so it's not evil. There's some good things, some good understandings of God and morality and ethics, and uh, in spite of some of the extremes we might see. But uh, one of the things that comes through regarding the character of Allah is he's so capricious. (laughs) He's like really capricious. Like, they'll quote this verse, God is compassionate and loving and taken from the Old Testament. And so, yeah, and then the next surat, he'll slap you across the ear for being a naughty boy for not rising up to it, for, for, it's like, hey? Eh? So you have Muhammad who says he received it from God, so he, he has this revelation, says, now go and kill the Jews. So 800, I think it was eight, six to 800 were massacred because they didn't follow him or obey him in this particular village. And then he gets another revelation, supposedly from God, saying, well, we, don't, we shouldn't be paying taxes as Muslims, so the Jews can pay the taxes and the Christians, so don't kill them. So in Islamic societies, those who are non-Muslims pay the taxes. And so it's like, hey, genocide, hey, preserve them. And you see the anthropomorphic dimensions. You see he's projecting his own political ideas, his own religious ideas into what he writes. But he, the God of, of Islam, Allah, is not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He ain't capricious. 
He is consistent all the way through in his nature and character. And even though there are good things in, in the Quran, some great, in fact, they take some of these scriptures and use them. So, but they have no concept of God being a father. They have no concept of God dying on our behalf because he loves us. That's almost impossible. God dying, being defeated? No, there's no understanding of atonement and redemption, that he died in our place because of love. And he offers us forgiveness and the gift of eternal life now, the assurance. And like every other religion, you never know when you've done enough good works to merit heaven. So there's no assurance of salvation. Are totally unlike uh, what David here is talking about. And so as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we're formed. He remembers that we're dust. He knows your frailty. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it's gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. Wow, isn't that great? My kids, my grandkids, I had the little girls over Friday night for a sleepover. An injurious thing to do. You get very little sleep. But it was great, like, we had a terrific meal together, they did some drawings, and then we watched My Girl. You ever seen that? Yeah. You want to cry all the way through a movie, watch My Girl. And so I'm crying like a baby, and they're all crying, so at 12 o'clock they go to bed. And I just said to Kathy, I said, that, you know, really, I said, we're sowing into those little kids. Next Friday night's the boys, oh, that's going to be horrendous. <laughs> so we sow into them, and I'm praying, not just my four kids, but their kids... And their grandchildren, not just their children, but their grandchildren, the stories are going to be passed on, even as I took one of them to the grave of my parents and I'm telling them the stories of Greece, stories that occurred in the early 1900s. And David says this, he says, hey, come on, from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. And so parents, believe for your kids, believe for your grandkids, believe for your great-grandkids and your great-great-grandkids in the years ahead, hey? The Lord has established his throne in heaven. I love this. He goes back to his greatness. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Jesus is number one in the universe. He raises up leaders. He oversees our world. Have a look at this. And he finishes this psalm like he begins. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts. You, his servants, to do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. This is a psalm of gratitude, thankfulness. And I love the balance that he's thankful to God for who he is, his essential nature and character. And these, the, 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 the beautiful image, you can't create a God like this, is that it's a revelation of saying, wow, what a God. And yet, and then we see what does this God do to fellow human beings. And David now en enunciates these. And so I'm grateful, thirdly, that God through Jesus richly provides for me. He has and he will, and he has for you and he will for you. And he wants to do these things in the lives of hundreds of people, thousands of people who we can reach out to this year through our witness family members, friends, work associates, neighbours. King David lists the benefits of God's goodness and greatness. And he's so grateful. And we can expect these in 2019. So what are they? He says in verse 3a, who forgives all your sins. I'm forgiven. You're forgiven. He actually starts with this. He goes, I've been forgiven. And if you look at David's sins, I mean, he really sinned. Because I'm forgiven. What does Jesus say to us? Well, the story of the woman caught in the, in the act of adultery, when the men gathered around to try and kill her, for what reason, we just don't know. They're trying to test Jesus. They didn't bring the man. That was a setup. And so they, 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 they bring this poor woman, and, uh, and then Jesus says this. This is what Jesus said to the woman, and he says the same to us today. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She looked up and says, no one, sir. 
neither do I condemn you. And Jesus here is saying, neither do I condemn you for your sins if you have genuinely turned to him and, and, and admitted your sinfulness and your sinful leanings and asked for his forgiving grace to remove your guilt and, and shame. And then he says, go now and leave your life of sin. So Jesus says this to us. He says, I forgive you and I will empower you to live above sin. Lady, that lifestyle is deadly. I'm going to help you. Cause just leave it. As if she'd go back to it now that she's received pure love. Probably for the first time in her life. That a man looked at her and looked into her soul and didn't just see a body or didn't see, I want to take advantage of you. She saw somebody who was adding value to her life, who was loving her through and through, loving her soul, and as if she would go back to the pit, into the mud. She wouldn't do that. And, and he helps us live above sin. And so let's expect him, the Lord Jesus, to save many people this year. Let's go and tell people about Jesus, your family and friends, and then invite as many of them to come and see. They don't know. The best kept secret in Adelaide is what happens here on a Sunday morning. But I rocked up in a church like this when I'm 17 and there was a, a song leader not as good as Yen or musicians not as good as our musicians. There was just an organ and a piano and somebody who thought they could sing that was trying to sing. <laughs> but I tell you what, when I walked in, the presence of God was there. It wasn't based on the proficiency of the musicianship. It was based on a heart of worship. And as they're singing, I'm thinking, oh, there's somebody here. And I didn't know who it was. It was Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And so we take it for granted. But you get people to come in, and they get, they're bowled over because God's presence. And then you get awesome preachers like Kathy Amen. getting up to preach the Word. And next Sunday, Jeremy Steele. And from time to time, I might get up. And you minister the Word. And God works through His Word as it's proclaimed faithfully, as, as we, we point people to Jesus, as we magnify the cross, as we lift up the cross, that it's the means by which we receive God's life and God's life and salvation. So people go and tell and invite them to come and see and experience. I'm grateful that God has provided forgiveness for me and I know that you are and the sign that we really are grateful is that we want to tell people about our story. Lovingly, gently, without harassing, without Bible bashing people, creating, building friendship links, talking, but praying, God, lead me, lead me to, to, to the conversation that I might be able to share about Jesus. I'm grateful that God through Jesus heals me. I'm healed through Jesus. David said, and he heals all your diseases. We have a firm healing covenant secured for us through the death of Christ on a cross and administered to us by the Holy Spirit through our prayers of faith. And that's why we've set up healing clinics. And we have them on Sunday afternoons. Why? Because we're saying, you know, let's put two hours, three hours aside where those who are incurably sick or those who are terminally ill or those who are facing pain and difficulty and can't function effectively in life, let's, let's pray for them. And people have come to Christ, not through our Sunday services, but through the healing clinics. They come and some people have received Christ and gone to be with the Lord and their bodies haven't been healed. But the most important thing is the healing of the soul that forgiveness and salvation has come into their lives. That's the most important thing, number one. The physical healings are signs of that God is real and they're, they're, they're kingdom signs that in heaven there'll be no sickness, no pain, no, no darkness, no devils. And so now we've got a foretaste of it and, and, and God heals. So we expect him to heal the sick, though we cannot guarantee that he will heal every person we pray for. Like we cannot guarantee that every person we witness to will receive Christ. Look at Jesus. David says, and he heals all your diseases. Look at Jesus. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her. And she got up and began to wait on him. So you can heal somebody without even saying anything. 
It's not a magical formula. You can just say, I'd, I'd like to pray with you if you're sick. Most people who are really sick and in pain will not object to say, look, you know, uh, uh, would you like me to just to pray for you? You know, we pray and sometimes people get healed. I'd like to pray for you. You don't even have to know what to be. Just touch them. Just close your eyes. And just talk to the Lord. Often Jesus never, never prayed to his father. He just laid hands on them. But an act of faith with an expectancy that the Lord will work through you. Just a simple touch. A simple touch. A blessing. Healing. And when evening came, it says, well, actually, she, he touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on him. Ah, oh, she's a good woman. Made a cup of tea and baked some scones and looked after them, eh? When evening came, many who were bound and influenced by evil spirits that had taken advantage of their human weakness or their vulnerabilities were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with the word. Isn't that great? It's just, I can just imagine Jesus would just say, be quiet, shut up, get out of him, stop it, stop tormenting them, get out of that person's mind and heart and body. Just quietly, he would just, just speak a word and just drive out anything of evil. How many times have I done that in praying for people? We sense as an evil presence. And, and sometimes they might even shudder. They don't know what's happening. They just say, just stop it. I don't say, stop it and leave that person. Lord, bless them, heal them. And, and you know, they're being tormented, they're being troubled. And sometimes there's no physical manifestation. But we are called to cast out evil, to stand against the devil. Your prayers are powerful. One word from you in Jesus' name can drive out the devil. Nurses in hospital, I encourage you with great wisdom and gentleness. Those that are sick and dying, just lay hands on them. You don't even have to pray. Let minister Jesus to them. You don't even have to say a word. Your prayers are powerful. Teachers, you've got to be discreet. But for kids that are troubled, just to to put a, a loving arm on their shoulder... And in your heart, you just say, hey, Jesus, touch this child, bless them, help them. As if the Lord's not going to rush through. It's your prayers, your faith, wherever you are, your neighbors, speak positive words. You represent Jesus. It says, this was to fulfill the, what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. In Matthew 8, it's quoted here, they quote Isaiah 53. He took up our infirmities... And he bore our diseases. He took up our infirmities, as he's talking about the cross, and he bore our diseases. Wow. He can heal you today. If you have a disease, if you have pain in your body, don't leave. Come out the front at the end of the service and let's lay hands on you. Let's give it a go. Doesn't take long. In fact, the shorter the better. Then we can go and have lunch. Lay hands. Don't have to pray long prayers to say, Jesus, heal. Lord, we need you. We'll even anoint you with oil, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. We'll lay hands on you, a symbol of the hand of God. Don't just say, oh, I've always had this. So, you've had it for a long time. I've been to the doctors. Great, keep going to the doctors. They believe in healing. So, oh, well, I'm just... God believes in healing. That's why he's given us the gift of medical science and all the other healing disciplines. So, believe, trust Him. Just changing your thinking patterns can actually change biochemistry and thinking patterns in your body where healing can actually flow. A positive mindset. Just to believe positively, to believe the right way. It's your right to to receive healing. It's your right to be made whole. It's your right to have symptoms alleviated. We can't guarantee it. But so let's pray for you. Let's believe together today he says i'm redeemed who redeems your life from the pit in psalm 103 (laughs) amazing who redeems your life from the pit i mean david knew the father's restorative love in his own life because he was in some pits you know and jesus gives us a wonderful parable on this one in luke 15 about the the kid that went wild i mean he's a bad boy he's a naughty boy i mean he's abusive of his father he just spends his inheritance, he blows it on prostitutes and wild living, wild drinking, he ends up losing everything. 
losing everything. You might think it's an exaggeration. I had a relative who blew $2 million of his parents' inheritance. Beautiful Greek people who worked like dogs for 40 years, and they came out from Greece. And this young man, a little bit older than me, a little bit older than me, he took it all and he blew it on riotous living. Within about five years, it was all gone. Left with nothing. The devil had a great party in hell over that young man. So it was pretty dark. And this boy was dark. And at the end, he's so hungry, he sees pigs. And Jews and pigs don't mix. And he lusted after the corn cobs. Oh, I want some of that. He's fighting the pigs for the food. He's so hungry. And he comes to his senses. And he says, man, what am I doing? What's happened to me? What's going on? And he says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. Notice that, against God and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he's kind of saying, man, I'm, I'm just blown. I expect nothing. And that's interesting with grace. He expects nothing. He doesn't deserve mercy. And he says, I'm just going to go back and say I'm sorry. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And he wasn't watching him saying, am I going to give you a piece of my mind? He didn't approach him with accusation and condemnation. He's looking with a heart of love and eyes anticipating the boy to come back because he's been praying, he's been believing for his boy to come back to him. And uh, when the father, a long way off, saw him and was filled with compassion and he runs to his son, throws his arms around him and he kisses him. Wow, isn't that beautiful? And that boy would have had scripts op operating in his mind saying, you're bad, you're mean, you're mighty unclean. You're naughty, you deserve hell and damnation, you deserve to be, you know, all these voices that would have, who, whoever put them there, we don't know. What happened to him as a child? Some trauma. Why, why would he turn where the other boy didn't? Why does one son stay loyal and the other one turn? We don't know. But certainly as he's living this terrible life, he, he, he would have developed habit patterns and voices in his brain saying to him, you deserve nothing, you deserve nothing. But now the father... He puts a new script into his mind by his behavior. And the father's non-accusatory, non-judgmental, accepting love. And he kisses him. Look what Psalm 2.12 says. Kiss his son or, or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. Notice your way, your independent way. This, this, this is a wonderful messianic statement. It has a local context, the writer. But he says here, kiss his son. It's an intimate symbol, kissing. It's a sign of faith. To kiss Jesus means you put your trust in him, your dependence on him. And it says, blessed are those who take refuge in him. There are limitless blessings that will flow to you when you put your trust in Jesus. His wrath can flare up in a moment. Be careful. See, heaven and hell are only a heartbeat away. You could be in heaven tonight or in hell tonight. You're just a heartbeat away. And this is saying, quickly, kiss the son, embrace him, receive the blessings of forgiveness and healing of your soul, be redeemed. Then he says, I'm crowned. And he crowns you with love and compassion. I love this. Back to the, to the story of Jesus and in, in, in the prodigal son. The son said to him, look at this. Talk about the son being sin conscious, like he's conscious of his sins. I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, like he doesn't even listen to him. The father doesn't even listen to him. So you might be rehearsing your past sins. You might be remembering them. But God says, uh, uh, what language are you talking? I don't understand what you're saying. Because you're a new creation. You're forgiven. You're redeemed. He goes, what, what are you saying? He says, I don't listen to that. I don't listen to that. My blood has been shed to cover you. 
I'm, I'm lifting you from the pit. I'm, I'm gradually washing you clean through my restorative love. Not only is there forgiveness, as David experienced, but there's also restoration of the, the influence, the mud, the mire that that's clings to us. The consequences of sin gradually he, he cleanses us. He loves us too much to leave us as we are. He gives us power to learn to overcome, to break old habits, embrace new ones, learn to live in victory, learn to exercise self-control and, 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 and mental discipline, change of habits. You can't do it yourself. You need Jesus doing that in you and through you. So the son is not even listening. For the son, his self-talk is sin-conscious. But have a look at the father. The father's consciousness is your new status. He says, but the father said to his servants, quick, 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 bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put on a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. And this is what Paul says about us. He says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Some of you are still groveling in the mud and you're looking up wistfully hoping one day you might earn salvation or maybe God might like you or that somehow you might just get in no 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 that that's the old script that's you've got to see yourself seated where's a stool here is there a stool oh someone give me a stool no pretend I'm sitting down I'm sitting down <laughs> sitting down who's next to me Jesus and who's next to Jesus the father when you're sitting you're resting you're resting you're trusting you're not working anymore you're looking to the work that Jesus did for you on a cross. You're looking at his worth as the son of God who died in your place. And so Paul says, come on, you've got to have a heavenly perspective, a new status. He's raised you up with Christ. You're seated with him in the heavenly realms. You have a great inheritance because you're now in Christ. Hey, I've listed about a hundred scriptures about our new inheritance on the me I can be, the first book I wrote a couple of years ago now. If you haven't got it, just grab one. If you don't have any money, I'll loan you some money. <laughs> Pay later, 15 bucks with all these scriptures. It all goes back to publications, but you need to re-script yourself to see yourself, that you actually are crowned, that you're seated with him in heavenly realms, that the Father doesn't, doesn't listen to your nonsense talk, your negative talk. You're downing yourself. He grieves over that. And he wants to change your believing. The biggest problem God has with you and me is our believing. We're either believing the right way or the wrong way. And if you're believing the wrong way, you're going to be defeated. And, and, and David is saying, he has crowned my life with love and compassion. Paul says, he's raised us up with Christ and seated us in heavenly places with him. He says, I'm satisfied who satisfies your desires with good things, King David said. Not with bad things, with good things. Jesus said these words, everyone who drinks this water, he said to a woman in John chapter 4 at the well, where he's ministering to her, this pagan lady, she's not a Christian, she's not a Jew. You'll be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Then in John 6, he says this, he says, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He can quench your thirst today. He can feed your soul. You can be satisfied with him. There are so many provisions, promises in his word that talk about the provisions that we can claim as part of our inheritance in him. He will and can meet all of your needs through Jesus Christ. In the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's all about starting off with who God is, where he is, is in heaven, his name, his kingdom, his will, not my name, my kingdom, my will, submitting to him. But then he goes on to all the needs that we face. Give us today our daily bread. Your physical needs, your financial needs, your material needs, Jesus is interested in them. You need a new job, you need extra finance. You have some, some material need in your life. He's interested. He's not going to, going to, to uh, give, as he says here, he satisfies your desires with good things. He's not going to give you something that, that's not in your best interest. And so in the Lord's Prayer, we can expect his help. 
He satisfies us. And then I'm renewed, which is uh, the, the final little bit. He goes, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, David says. And this is Jesus now saying, you need to come to me if you're weary and you're burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. You see, the second part of the Lord's Prayer, which says, give us this day our daily bread to do with our physical, material, financial needs. But then he goes, goes now f- learn to forgive. People have let you down. People have hurt you and you've hurt them. So, so Father, for- let go. Forgiveness. If they've trespassed against you, he goes, don't, don't trespass against it. Learn to live in forgiveness. And then he says about temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Okay? Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He actually is talking about our relational, psychological, spiritual needs. And I tell you, they can, when you have broken relationships and emotional baggage that you're carrying and spiritual issues that, that you're facing, I tell you, it, it can weary you and burden you. And so he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You need to get yoked with Jesus. You know, in, in most of the, the developing world, they still use oxen and wild buffalo to, to do the ploughing. They don't use tractors. Do you know how they train the young buffaloes? Well, we'll say an ox, a big oxen. Great, they're big, big guys, okay? And so they're well trained. And so you get an old oxen and, and the guy's digging, you know, doing a, a line where he wants to plant his thing and the oxen just goes, he's pretty good. But you get the young boys, the young bucks that are untrained and you harness him up and as he's going along, that young, that young ox will see a female over there, female ox. He'll go, hmm, <laughs> and ruin the row. Or he says, gee, I'm feeling hungry. There's some corn over there. I'm going to eat. I'm going to go that way. And so the farmers go crazy because you can't stop that young buck. He's, he's wild. He's just out of control. He's got to learn from an old buck. So what they do is they yoke him. You know, yoke. Hook him up with the old boy. So the old boy is twice his size and the young boy and they're doing the row and the old boy's going and the young guy goes, hmm, girl over there. He tries to go but the old boy goes, we're not going there. We're going, pleasure later. Work now. Well, there's food over there. No, no, we're going to have food later. So that young oxen gets broken in by learning from the older one. And he's got to learn submission. He's got to learn to control his impulses and, and follow the example. And the Lord is using this. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Because I'm gentle and, and humble in heart. And those words don't do it justice. That The two Greek words are two of the most magnificent Greek words you can find in, in uh, the New Testament. The word prautes and Tapinothrosi, they're magnificent words. They're actually saying strong men and women who have all their powers under control. A person who's meek is not weak. A person who's gentle, a gentle man, a humble man, a humble woman, is someone who's really strong, who knows how strong they are, but they've got all those powers yielded and under his control. It's like that young bull oxen, that young boy. He's got to learn to bring all his powers under control by learning from the old boy. And we learn from Jesus. And he says here, then you're going to find rest for your souls. The emotional, spiritual, relational needs you have can weary you down and some of you are burdened. And he wants to lift that burden. And the only way he can lift that burden is if you get yoked to Jesus Christ and learn from him and submit to him and let him build his beautiful nature into you. The self-control, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, those characteristics that we call the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's the nature of Jesus Christ. And so this 2019, this first Sunday, let's believe God. 
Let's be thankful for what he's done in 2018, but let's believe that he wants to do these things in 2019 to you and to work through you to bring blessing into other people's lives. Can you say amen to that? Let's stand together.